This conference will now be recorded. Uh, making companion crops with cash crops work. I have found this to be one of my five emerging trends for 2019. I shared this a couple of weeks ago in our in our, our weekly webinar. And so I want to take a lot of those trends up front here and really dive into them uh, uh, kind of individually, uh, not necessarily in order here, but in the first few weeks, first few months of this year. So I really wanted to talk about this because it's it's something that is being uh, talked about more and more here uh, lately. Just a little history from, from my perspective. I first was introduced to this concept when I was in France in 2010. And I'd never heard about it before. And uh, of course, by that time, I had understood the synergistic effects by growing multiple species together in the context of cover cropping, where we saw that you grew a couple different species of cover crops together and you could see it just benefited everything, but never really even thought about trying to incorporate a cash crop into that scenario. And I'll just say that I, I like to use the little bit of analogy here. When you use mixed species, that one plus one equals three. And that's just to make a point of the both characteristics of two different types of species generally enhance one another. Now it doesn't work quite as well with, with some as it does with others, but uh, where I first saw this was simply using cereal rye and hairy vetch. Uh, when you plant them together, they both grow better. The hairy vetch is giving nitrogen to the cereal rye, which it needs because it's a grass. The cereal rye in turn, provides a trellis for the hairy vetch to climb in, allowing the hairy vetch to even grow more, which then in turn helps the uh, cereal rye. So it's kind of a cycle of benefit there. And that's just one good example. I've understood that for many years. I've seen it. I started growing them two together back in 1995. So uh, a long, long uh, relationship with that scenario. So here I am in France in 2010, and I see this in the context of oil seed rape which is a major cash crop in all of Europe. And, uh, and, and just for those who may not know, oilseed rape is very similar to canola. Uh, there are some differences. Sometimes it's in name only, but just as in any other cash crop we grow, like corn or soybeans, there's a lot of varieties and variations. So I just want to set you up for just to tell you that first. In this case, we're generally talking about an oilseed production. The little seeds are crushed and made into some kind of an oil to, <clears throat> to be used somewhere. So this is the context here. We have oil seed rape as the cash crop. And what was so fascinating for me was, is this is planted in a very late summer or early fall. They were planting other species of cover crops with the oil seed rape at the same time. And the whole idea behind this is, using some legumes that can grow long enough to provide benefit for the cash crop, mainly nitrogen production, using some grasses to kind of balance out, give some diversity, and to help maybe shade the areas so winter annual weeds don't grow and things like that. And so you, you, you kind of develop this little plan here to do this, and ideally all these other cover crops will winter kill. So by the time you go through the winter, all you have left coming out the next spring is your oilseed rape or your cash crop. And in this case, these pictures were taken in March, I believe it was, maybe early April, I forget the exact dates. So we're coming out of winter dormancy, just starting to, uh, to, to, uh, to start to grow. And so where you see the cover crops in this case are dead because they were winter killed. I have heard some people using herbicides and doing the exact same thing, and that may be what you need to do at some point. So uh, this is what really got me started in it and, and being able to see that. And so I'm thinking, well, I don't grow oil seed rape. What can I do? How can I apply this principle? 
we happen to grow a lot of wheat in our area. And um, I had already been planting radishes with wheat. And that was that was kind of uh, got started right around the same time where a farmer mistakenly had left some radishes in his drill. He put wheat in to plant wheat and he called me up and said, I'm not sure what to do. I got radishes coming up for my wheat. This guy lived in an area where I knew the radishes were going to winter kill. I said, well, just don't, don't worry about it. They'll just die over winter. He called me from the combine next July as he's harvesting wheat. He said, you'll never believe this, but the yield monitor is showing a 12 bushel increase where the radishes were planted with the wheat. And I'm like, wow, uh, did not surprise me. But in another way, it did surprise me because uh, wasn't even expecting that. So over the years, then we took that information and took this concept, applied it more to wheat because that's what I'm more familiar with. Um, and, and here's just a picture to show you in the fall, radishes grow faster than any other cover crop there is uh, or any cash crop almost, you could say. It's been documented time and time again. But even when we're planting radishes late in their normal planting window, this is just a picture here of two weeks after planting. You can see how fast they've grown. And at this point, the radish doesn't even have a tuber on it. Now, they usually grow longer than this, and they will grow longer than this. They will get bigger. But there's something happens within the soil that I can't explain it. I'm sure some scientists can explain it, that it will actually help and benefit. In this case, the mixed species is a cash crop. In this case, is wheat. So I'm not here today to explain the science behind it. Uh, I just know that it works. Uh, one of the things that we feel with radishes is that they we know that radishes are very good at picking up sulfur, and also they're very good at picking up leftover nitrogen in the fall. And quite conceivably, you could you could argue that uh, the radishes are taking up nitrogen that could be lost, and then as they are winter killed, they give it back to the wheat in the spring. Now, in the trials of testing yields and everything. We saw yield responses anywhere from zero to, I've seen up, people have claimed up to 20 bushel of the acre. And I'm just going to throw, throw that out because it wasn't scientific. It was just like side by side. The reality was we saw yield increases of three to five bushels per acre uh, with, when we planted these radishes with the wheat. And sometimes I think there was no yield increase because they might have applied an early of a spring or winter dormancy break of nitrogen maybe erased the effect. Don't know. But nonetheless, I always am planting radishes with my small grains now. I just do it. I don't compare it anymore. It can only help. Does it pay? You know, putting two pounds or three pounds, we'll say, of radishes. And in, in the U.S., we're, we're talking, you know, six dollars uh, or, or so. No more than that. You just have to get essentially one bushel, bushel and a half to pay for it. Uh, so we just know that it's good for the soil, even though the radishes don't grow very much. So this this principle is kind of what we're basing this on in, in this context. Now, let's travel back to Europe again. Uh, this is last spring. I was in Belgium. And uh, they have taken this concept much, much further now because it, it's working. And uh, what you see there is an oil seed rape field in the spring. The tall plants that are dead were fava beans. So these were planted early enough in the fall that they grew to be two, two and a half feet tall. And there's several other species in that mix. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with oil seed rape, it's generally planted at the end of August, beginning of September. So there is time to have these companion crops grow. And I'll show you some pictures coming up here a little bit more uh, on this. And uh, But when you look a little bit closer, you can see that for the most part, there's, there's a little ground showing there right now. But for the most part, these companion crops, which are dead, that's the dead things you see laying there, they have shaded out winter annual weeds, which is nice because then if it does a good job, you won't need to use spring applied herbicides which isn't necessarily always needed in this crop, but it, it does, it is sometimes. 
so the other thing is that fava bean is going to be giving off some nitrogen for the oil seed rape to to utilize. So th the fact that we can lower not only our herbicides, we can also lower our um, our uh, fertilizer as well. And then to take it a step further, some of the high level management requires uh, fungicides in the spring or even insecticides. And people who are doing this are finding out that they can actually use very little to no insecticides, no fungicides, no herbicides, less fertilizer. And all of a sudden, we have an opportunity here that's way more than going to pay for that cover crop seed, let alone all the soil health benefits that come along with that. Uh, one of the things that they were trying here was to use actually a white clover as well in the mix. In the field I saw, there wasn't a lot that survived, but the white clover is somewhat slower growing, whereas the oil seed rape is fast growing. It's not going to hurt the cash crop. Then once the oil seed rape is harvested, that clover is going to be right there, ready to go, and to be a cover crop right there. So this this is somewhat complex, but this is what is 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 occurring now. One of the things that really fascinated me was Bayer Crop Science had a plot in this field. Actually, there was over 117, I think it was. 117 plots replicated. They were looking at interactions of herbicides. Uh, the farmer was very progressive, and he's like, I don't think I need any herbicides here. But Bayer, to their credit, I will say, was working with him and testing various herbicides in the conjunction with these companion crops. And to me, that's pretty, that's pretty advanced for where we're at with all this. And I just found it interesting that they were at the point where they're actually working with a major uh, herbicide company in the context of this practice. Um, I'm just going to uh, pause here a little bit and uh, put the everybody's microphone back on. Just wanted to know if there's any comments. I know we have a couple people from Germany on today. Uh, and, and maybe I'll just start, uh, if, if it's possible, here with... With uh, with Michael uh, Reber, I don't know if I'm saying your name right, but uh, I don't know if you can comment on this or not, Michael. It'd be great. Or is there someone else that could comment so far about this whole concept of companion cropping with oil seed rape or other cover cover, cover crops? So yeah, tell us, Michael, a little bit what you know. I saw you typing in here in the side, but um, <coughs> what where where are you at with this? What's your experience? Well, there are a lot of farmers now trying this kind of companion cropping in, in all seed rape it's getting very popular in europe because we have lots of problems with resistances in mm -hmm. insecticides mm -hmm. so they use the companion crops to to irritate the insects mm -hmm. Let's so tell, tell me more about tell me more about that um, because I've seen that in my own farm as well uh, with the with the insects or is there more you can explain why why do the insects uh, don't seem to be as bad is it because we're promoting the beneficials or is there another reason yeah, well, I I can't, I can't tell you at the moment because I I don't grow Aussie trade but I okay. think it's yeah there are more um uh the problem is the, <laughs> the words in english yes uh, no problem i that's okay i i here you i'm right just happy you're here comment. yeah mm -hmm. steve well, i've got some yeah go ahead go ahead ian. Yeah, ian tell us what you know from the uk there are there are a number of different objectives for different types of companion crop mm -hmm. um certainly with fava beans there seems to be something synergistic between beans and oilseed rape okay. so they just seem to be um as we would say here best friends they they just okay. seem to grow well together there's something that goes on between them which really helps mm -hmm. yep yep from my from my own work in to do with pest insects and our biggest problem is one called cabbage stem flea beetle um the the work that i've sort of listen to from France, their their theory is that flea beetle find the oilseed rape plants 
through a mixture of colour and smell that comes off the oilseed rape leaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the theory of putting a companion crop with it is to stop the crop looking or smelling just like an oilseed rape crop. Okay. So, um, so we put in things that are very likely to be winter kills. So we've used buckwheat and phacelia in order mm -hmm. to, dis to disguise the oilseed crop. Hmm. Um, and we need to be careful with the rates of those so that they don't dominate too much. Sure. But then we also use um, bursine clover with oilseed hmm. rape as a companion, but that does a different job. That That's okay. one of the, the fastest rooting crops that we have. Okay. And, and the idea, and it's, I, I found it seems to work, but I'm, you know, it's fairly anecdotal at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the yeah. the idea is the bursine clover roots more quickly than the oilseed mm -hmm. rape plants, and then mm -hmm. the oilseed rape roots follow the root path down oh. that the bursine has created. I see. So I had that, never heard that before, but that's great. So that's that's the idea. Um, it's it's been used. I mean, we've done several hundred hectares of it, and I know other people have as well here. Right. And, um, you know, the results have been mixed. We've, we've had other significant challenges to establishment, such as this year was drought. So um, that, that's a real challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's quite a lot going on here to try all these things. Um, right. Good. Well, hey, thanks for that. Thanks for that update. I'm going to uh, move on because I have a couple more things. I'm going to open it up again for everybody. But I really, really appreciate uh, some of your hands-on uh, experience and so forth. So um, there's some other methods here doing kind of the same concept. Uh, what you see here is uh, you can see buckwheat that's just coming out in flower, but underneath there you'll see oil seed rape. This was in France the last time I was there, September uh, of uh, 2017, and this is actually volunteer oilseed rape. In other words, in 2016, it was grown. It was harvested in June, end of June of 2017. Buckwheat was planted. And then there was a regrowth here from what came out the back of the combine or what shattered at the header. Uh, and the idea here was we have nothing to lose. And in this case, the variety of... Uh, I'm assuming it was not a hybrid or anything, so it was it was it was a viable hybrid. So uh, they planted the buckwheat, and the idea here is to harvest the buckwheat, and then essentially have that regrowth then be the next year's cash crop. So it's like a volunteer cash crop, <clears throat> growing a buckwheat crop in between for uh, basically for cover crop seed. So here's my friend Frederic Thomas from France. And this is a far away picture of the field, beautiful field. Look, I mean, just again, no, I don't think any herbicides on here. It was oil seed rape planted into buckwheat. Now the oil seed rape is a little bit ahead uh, because normally they'd be planting it about this time. And uh, that could be a concern to be a little bit too far advanced, especially if they get colder than normal weather, it may freeze it out. Uh, but, there's another option to do here that can help against that, and that is to graze. To, if you have the opportunity to graze sheep or animals to cut it back a little bit, that could be an option. I did not put any pictures in, but when I was in Australia, they were also growing uh, some brassicas like canola, where they were planting it early, uh, or I should say late spring. Normally you plant it late summer. They were planting it late spring, <clears throat> grazing it, with sheep, a lot of sheep in Australia, that would <clears throat> that would essentially hold it back enough so then it would survive through the winter and do its uh, normal cycle. So uh, these are just some fascinating uh, things that you can do with cover cropping and cash cropping kind of together. Now, this next picture here is again uh, from this is from France. This is um, this is really. Um, how it normally looks. Of course, this is no-tilled mix. There is your rape in there, your fava beans, and uh, I think there was a little phacelia and some flax or something. I'm looking here right now myself to see some sunflowers I see early enough to get these cover crops to grow. 
uh, in the context of the cash cropping. So this is kind of normally how you would see this. Uh, Eon posted here a question. He'd be nervous about grazing green buckwheat, especially with sheep. Uh, and I, I just want to clarify that the buckwheat would be harvested for seed, so there would not be much left of any greenness. So it's a great point, though, because some of these nuances sometimes you have a great idea about something, and then you know something in it won't maybe work. So thanks for pointing that out. Really, uh, really appreciate that, Eon. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I've seen, and I've only seen this in Europe so far, uh, where is where, and I'm sorry the picture wasn't quite centered the way it should have been. Um, this is in, in France, but um, this is actually a seed company that developed a seed mix uh, to be planted with the oil seed rate. Um, and if you look at the very bottom, it's cut off. It says companion plant seeds. So there's actually seed companies developing mixes to be able to add to the cash crop in the very uh, thing we're talking about here today. Now, the other thing is there were actually some seed companies I've seen actually mix, pre-mix the oil seed rape with their accompanying companion cover crops. I've seen some of that. I was unable to find a seed tag or anything to show you, but nonetheless, that is one thing that is, is happening. Uh, any questions? Uh, I'm going to open up the microphones again. Any questions or comments, observations up to this point? Then I'm going to tell you how I've applied this to my farm here in Pennsylvania. Any other questions or comments uh, so far on what we're discussing? Anybody? Are any of these uh, ideas, could they be included with spring seeded like canola, like what we grow here in, yeah. like up in the north? Um, that's a great question. Um, might have, um, just seeing who else is on this call. I don't see anyone I recognize now that could answer that. I do know, and I did mention this at the very beginning, that there is an option of to, to take out your cover crops with herbicides at some point. And then you got to know what herbicides you're using and so forth. And I definitely think that's a viable option because uh, almost everything, or I should say everything I've shared so far, we're going to use winter kill to take this out. And so um, right, Eon's suggesting here on the chat just to try a small leafed white clover or a trefoil in the spring. And and I know enough about them that they're just going to be in the under the understory under the canopy of that. So uh, that that's a good discussion to have. Is there anybody else have any suggestions on spring planted crops that you could do this companion cropping? Um, uh, concept here. Other suggestions from anybody? Anybody? Uh, Steve? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm in Manitoba here. Awesome. And um, yeah, I grow canola obviously here. Most mm -hmm. people do. Yep. And uh, I haven't really taken note, but it was suggested that uh, that guys are seeing a lot less flea beetle pressure where the wild oat patches are are worse. Um, oh, definitely going to keep an eye on that and might try a very light rate of oats with our mm -hmm. canola this year and then take out with herbicide. Okay. Um, well, we have, uh, I don't know if you know, Ron Smith is on here as well. He's from Manitoba, but maybe you guys could uh, connect a little bit more in that. And um, I do know that you probably know Derek Axton over there in Saskatchewan. I know he's doing a lot with this concept in growing mixed species of cover crops for cover crop as a cash crop or the, for the seeds for cash for cover crops, excuse me. Um, I'm working with that as well. And I see Andy's back on here. Andy from Alberta. Do you have any more comments here? There was a question. I think you were off a little bit. There was a question about spring planted, uh, spring planted uh, canola or spring planted crops and mixing a, a, a cover crop with that. Do you have any comments on that, Andy, if you're able to respond? Or anybody else, for that matter? Okay, go ahead, Andy. Uh, I just uh, reset my computer by turning off yeah. my power bar. I just heard you say uh, spring planted canola. Um, yeah, any companion crops with spring planted canola? I have in the past used yellow blossom sweet clover, and it's nice because it's a biennial, so in the first year it stays a little bit lower. 
And then mm -hmm. in the second year, uh, I've terminated her with glyphosate, mm -hmm. uh, kind of mid mid bloom, which is yeah. early June, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And uh, works really well as as a green manure. Um, uh -huh. You can terminate it at any time you want. But the nice thing is that it overwinters if that's what you want. I think it would have a really good option uh, planting corn mm -hmm. into it afterwards. Yes. Okay. Because you have an sure. overwintering cash crop, so or overwintering sure. cover crop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the exact kind of the ideas that we're talking about here today. Um, and uh, I'll just say that Eon from from the UK has is, is, is done some work with this. He's just saying that uh, some of these other crops we're talking about really help feed the mycorrhizae, which is important. And that's partly why this works. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm going to show you a few numbers at the end of the day, but you know, we got to make this pay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're spending some money for these other seeds, but we're also reducing our inputs as well. And I think in long term, it's it's really uh, it's really good. Now, Michael from Germany is saying here in the chat, we have we we have here, which is he's from Germany, a mixture of slow growing lawn grasses. Now that's interesting. We have to have a discussion about that sometime. Lawn grasses and white clover, which can be seeded very early in the spring. This can be used in all crops. Um, yeah, that would be curious to know, Michael. Could you just do you have any more specifics in what lawn grasses you're talking about? Is it a, is it some sort of a rye grass? Is it a perennial? Is it an annual? If you could just respond to that, that would be really, really good. Um, Eon's saying here fescues, and uh, Michael's just responding. Lawn grasses are bred for root growth. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that that's a that's kind of a new one for me there. Something that I think I need to check into. Maybe we should utilize some of these genetics that we haven't. I haven't thought about that before. Um, and obviously, when we're doing companion cropping, the whole issue of harvest and timing of maturity and everything is very important. So anything low growing uh, could be a, a serious option there. And um, I'm also kind of just giving you play by play here as I see this come up in the chat. Uh, Ian saying that tall fescue is very drought tolerant, so which is helpful because Usually our cash crop is going to get first first chance at any moisture, and if the moisture gets low, your cash crop is going to get it first because it's usually bigger and more advanced. Uh, but you want something underneath there that can actually withstand some dry weather uh, due to that. So that's that's really good. Before I share what I'm doing here at my place in Pennsylvania, any other comments or questions up to this point? Anyone? Were you gonna say something, Ron? I see you're on, but maybe maybe it's not. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna mute everybody, and we're gonna uh, kind of wrap this up here, and then I'll get your questions ready for the end, or I'll just say any questions out there. Here, here's a picture of what I'm doing in my farm. Uh, I uh, never oilseed rape, canola, never grown in my area. It just isn't. Uh, I actually tell you a quick story here. Uh, I had 14 acres last year planted on a rented farm about five miles from my place. My neighboring farmer said, hey, Steve, did you see that yellow field? And he named the road and everything. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, it looks like mustard. What in the world is a guy planting mustard for down there? And I said, oh, that's that's my field. I'm renting it. He goes, what is that? And basically, just the, the point is, nobody has any clue uh, what these some of these crops are as cash crops. So that was kind of fun to introduce that to this area. The reason is, is there's a local company on the East Coast here, Purdue. They have uh, they're mostly known for their chickens, but they also have an agriculture division. They are contracting an oilseed rape that's high uric acid to be used in food grade application of lubrication and also in actually some food products. So they were looking for acres, and I'm, I'm like, bingo, man, I'm ready for this. I want to try what I've seen in Europe. So this is my third year. I think I'm getting a little bit better at it. Uh, this was taken, uh, I don't have the date on this picture here. I'm going to guess around the end of September, beginning of October, would have been wheat. So we had plenty of time there to plant this when it's supposed to be planted in our area, the end of August, beginning of September. And by the way, I had a cover crop between my wheat and this. So we're, we're pretty intensive around here uh, in, in what we do in, in that regard. Uh, so 
Uh, this is just a picture now from straight down, looking from the top. Um, and, and as I adjust rates and so forth, it was mentioned earlier, you got to be careful with seeding rates. We don't want our co our cover crops to to uh, to to shade our cash crops. So there has to be a certain amount of uh, of I guess you'd say trial and error. As I look at this here, I may up a few of the rates of, uh, and I'm going to show you the rates here later on of all the cash crops. But I wish there'd be a little more there. If you look down in there, you can see a little bit of hen bit and, and uh, chickweed, which is winter annuals that we have. I do not expect this to be a problem in the spring, uh, but just saying, I'm still working with the seeding rates and it's kind of, I'm fine tuning it, uh, I guess you'd, I guess you'd say. Um, so uh, this next picture is, 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 is a, uh, an important factor when doing this. Since I'm growing this under contract, by the way, for Purdue, I have to sort of have the blessing of the company to do this because their protocol has nothing at all about this. The good thing is they're interested in what I'm doing. So I've kind of been given a little bit of leeway because they're interested in, and this is actually the rep representative here from Purdue with my son, David, and he was here this past fall looking at it. At it and they're, I would say that they're intrigued with what's going on here. And so, so this is an aspect that you have to be aware of, especially if you're under contract, that uh, you don't violate or, or anything in that way that that they don't like. I've I've heard of things like these happening before with some of this novel concept. So make sure you're doing it right. Now, fast forward to right now. This was just taken about 10 days ago. Uh, in our area, we've had several nights in the upper teens Fahrenheit. So you can see that everything is kind of, I'll just say, uh, starting to uh, starting to get winter killed. Uh, we have since gotten a little bit of snow, not a whole lot. We've had colder temperatures in the mid-teens Fahrenheit. It's even going to be colder next week. So our cover crops are slowly dying, but our uh, oilseed rape will survive and come through. If you look closely there, you can see some henbit. And a little chickweed underneath there, um, at this point, I'm not really concerned about it. But I think I need to up my rates a little bit. Uh, even my oilseed rape is a little light here. So this is just, you're just seeing this stuff in action uh, in what I'm doing and as I as I learn as well. Here is the what you're looking at. Uh, three pounds of oilseed rape, which is, they say here three pounds, four pounds uh, is is where the where you want to target it. Uh, if you're drilling it in seven and a half inch rows, which we do, I uh, again these are just best guesses of what I thought we should do. I put ten pounds of spring oats, five pounds fava beans, and five pounds each of spring peas and chickling vetch. Um, I threw chickling vetch in there because I saw that in Romania how good of a cover crop that seemed to be. And so I threw that in there. And one pound of flax. Uh, flax is one of those things that I'm starting to use anytime I can. It's really good at promoting, uh, encouraging mycorrhizae. And it's just, again, another plant family. So this this costs around $20 an acre. These Some of these seeds are a little bit novel. And, and if you don't get a good volume on it, you'll have to pay a lot more than that. This 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 could cost you double that, depending on how you get your seeds. But just saying, we're, we're looking at 20 bucks. And, you know, how does that math work? Uh, I'm pretty sure with no herbicides, no planned herbicides. Uh, actually, I'm not planning even to use any uh, nitrogen in the spring. I may. We'll see how it looks. But just saying right now. And uh, I have I've historically not been using insecticides anyway in most of my crops or fungicides. So if you start adding savings up here, you can see that this this pays. And all we're trying to do, in my, in my estimation, is to try to keep the yields uh, where they are traditionally in your in your field. So uh, that's a little bit where where I'm coming at with that. So um, so uh, just going to open up the lines here again uh, for anyone to suggest other uh, cash crops that accommodate cover crop species. Is there anything else out there that people have been trying? I know this has been focused on rape, but uh, or canola, uh, and we talked about uh, wheat in the in the beginning. We did talk a little bit about some spring planted applications, but is there other applications out there 
where we can apply these principles uh, in, in, in the context of cash crops and cover crops. Um, just, just wonder if anybody has any other ideas. Anyone? Any comments from anybody? Anything to add? Well, I'll still give you some time to think about it. I want to tell you that next week I'm going to do a kind of a different type of a webinar. It's uh, cover cropping around the world in 30 minutes, basically taking some of the best of things that I've seen in other countries, Australia, Europe, South Africa, Canada. Um, I uh, have been doing this, actually, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, I've done this uh, three times now, and I just actually just did it yesterday. You'll see a post on Facebook. If you're on our Facebook group, there's a local equipment company. They sell equipment. They wanted me to do this because they heard one of the people heard me do it at another place. And the room was like, you know, there's 500 people there. And to be able to talk cover crops at a place where they sell tractors and combines and corn choppers, I just thought, that was a monumental moment to be able to 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 be able to actually do that uh, and, and not talk about steel uh, and and paint and everything. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take that presentation and, and give it to you guys here. Uh, if nothing else, you'll find it entertaining. But I think you're gonna see uh, some really important things that maybe could be helpful in in what you may uh, be doing. So. Uh, just to wrap up today's uh, webinar, appreciate the comments we've had so far. Um, uh, any cover crop question at all that you have, we'll wrap up with that. I'm going to catch up here in some of the chat. Appreciate those who have been in that. Um, Michael from Germany said last year they're trying barley with crimson clover and camelina without herbicides. Uh, so uh, that that is... Uh, is interesting and then and then darren asked did the camelina go to seed and and i'm wondering if the crimson clover didn't cause a problem at harvest either so i don't know if you can answer that michael that'd be awesome if you could um so so uh paul's asking in the winter wheat uh with the radish over winter i talked about that in the beginning of our presentation today basically radish will kill will winter kill on uh, if you have a, a few consecutive nights in the mid-teens Fahrenheit, they're minus 7 Celsius, that's going to pretty much take it out. If you're in an area that does not get that cold, there is there is a choice of several herbicides that you can use to take it out, and, and further, areas further south. So it's, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't kill. Uh, I will say this, you do want to kill it. You don't want the radish to grow because it'll flower in the spring and it'll come up and, and uh, you don't want radishes growing up into your wheat. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but uh, anyway, I see some more chats coming in here. You guys are really on it today. I appreciate that. Um, Ian says that in France, he's seen them grow triticale and fava beans together. They combine both and separate them after harvest. I have also seen that with wheat and peas. My concern has been, and I can't figure this out, at least the varieties we have here, the way we set the combine to thrash wheat is generally the rotor speed is double what you would use for peas, and also you would tighten it to the concave a lot more. So how do they not split the fava beans or the peas? And I don't know, maybe, Eon, you have an answer to that. That's a question I have there, because uh, in my experience with harvesting wheat, we run the rotor pretty fast, way faster than I ever do with peas. I would think it would crack them or split them. And we run it a lot closer than we do peas. So that'd be a question I'd have on that. Um, Michael's responding back here. They're, they did have a problem with camelita. It's very light. And I could see that camelita is a small seed. It'd be hard to not blow that out the back and not have a lot of chaff in there from your barley. So, um, so he's saying the crimson clover worked well with that. And um, so anyway, Paul, I see you're from Eastern Ontario. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem with the radish. I know some people up there tried it. By the way, I'm going to be in Guelph on Saturday. I don't know if you're coming to that Farm Smart meeting they have, but it'd be great to see you there if you're coming. Um, so anyway, some more comments here. I'll just just uh, just read them. Approximately 130% of the total yield of either crop on their own. So I guess you're responding back 
to uh, the other triticale and follow bean. One thing that I think in this whole thing of growing things mixed together, our mindsets need to change a little bit. And I had this conversation with a few people. Uh, number one, that if indeed we can utilize two crops together for whatever reason, for feed, why not? You know, do we have to separate everything all the time? Uh, we don't necessarily. Uh, so if it's if it's if it's somewhat compatible in harvesting, you know why why uh, why couldn't we uh, you know look at that? Uh, uh, but so anyway, hey, I don't want to take up more time here. Does anybody else have any other cover crop questions? I have all the mics open. Um, is there any other cover crop question about this topic or any other topic you've been thinking about? Uh, just to wind up our uh, webinar today. Anyone? Yeah, Steve, um, just a quick question about um, the uh, chicory, like where that oh. would have a place in, in cover crops. I, I hear about it, but I don't, I haven't come across a lot of information on where people are using it. Right. Uh, I am familiar with chicory. We have it kind of as a weed around here, and I've grown it and looked too close to the weed. I'm like, how can I grow that? That just doesn't seem right. I do know that chicory can be grown for a forage. That seems to be the place for it. Matter of fact, I have 50 pounds of chicory set in here that I am planning on trying to intentionally plant in a forage situation, a perennial forage like with orchard grass. I'm going to give it a try again. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say that chicory is, is the way to go. It does have a really good taproot, I know. Um, uh, Eon's saying that they grow perennial chicory in UK as a habitat crop. Uh, but it's much, but it, but it is much too dominant to use a companion, in my view. I would kind of agree with that without knowing a whole lot. Uh, I would go slow on chicory. I know that there's a few people out there that's kind of like chicory is one of their, I guess you'd say, go-to cover crops. But usually it's in the context of some sort of forage. So not a lot. Do you, do you know more information on that? Uh, Ron, or, or, or what do you think? You, you're going to try it, or what do you think? Well, just because it was a small seed, I was wondering if that would be a good fit just for, mm -hmm. for, for some of the blends. But from yeah. I'm hearing, hearing a lot of cautions from you. So yeah, I, I think it's very, uh, very fair. Eon's saying it's very fast growing. It becomes woody in the second year. I agree to that. Um, that's why I've kind of checked it off my list of, you know, my, <laughs> should I say my top, 50 or something like that. Um, so I, I would be very cautious with chicory. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions anybody has? Comments? Anybody? Hey, Steve. Yep, go ahead. Uh, we grow a few pumpkins. I thought one of your hmm. uh, a real early uh, slides showing your pumpkins, why maybe you're using drip irrigation. Okay. Uh, but now, now that you're doing cover crops, are you not? I assume you're not. Is is that true or not? Well, I don't have a yes and no answer. I do have the ability to apply drip irrigation, but uh, because of growing cover crops and so forth, I don't generally need drip irrigation. There are times in our area where we get into a dry, we call it a dry spell. Uh, four weeks of, of no rain. For us, that's a dry spell. I know some of you are laughing, but hey, that's just where we're at. Uh, and uh, because it's a very high value crop, it's not hard to pull drip tapes out. You don't really have to place them right next to the, uh, the row. Even with them fully vined out, we'll just pull drip tapes out. Around, we'll just get them close to the row. Uh, and the, the nice thing about it is it's a nice way to get some water on. Uh, I kind of use drip irrigation as an emergency only. It is a pain to pull out. It's a pain to pull back in. But it's a high-value crop. Not all my fields have access to irrigation. So uh, to answer your question, it's an emergency. I have drip tape here. I reuse it. I invested back, back when I was raising sweet corn. I found that if I buy a higher... Uh, quality or higher mill uh, drip tape that I could use it multiple times and it became much more affordable. And I actually built a drip irrigation retrieval reel that's hydraulically ran. We can pull in drip lines faster than you can run. 
And when you have 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet of that, that makes it kind of fun to at least to pull it in. It's not fun pulling it out. But uh, so that's that's your answer there with growing pumpkins. We only use it in emergencies. But, so um, do you have trouble? Do you have trouble with mice uh, chewing on it? We have had that occasionally. Uh, <clears throat> basically, every time we start it up, we kind of walk around a little bit and just make sure we don't see or hear any leaks anywhere. Uh, not a big problem, but it yes, we've had that problem. Okay, thank you. You're quite welcome. Other questions from anybody? Any question at all? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, last call. I hesitated there a little in case anybody's thinking. Well, okay. Thank you for your your great questions today and all the chat questions and everything. Uh, we'll get this out to you in a couple days. Looking forward to seeing you next week. We'll talk about cover cropping around the world. And in the meantime, as always, stay curious and keep learning. See ya. <laughs>